I think I broke Unlike his fiddle Uncle Banzai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of him. Before we get started, I want to give you a little tour of Glasnevin, Glasnevin Cemetery. Okay, this is where our funeral for Patty Dignam is taking place, and I wanted to give you some perspective. Here's Dublin, and they're taking the ride up through town, and they cross the rivers, and up to the Glasnevin Cemetery which is the Catholic cemetery, and next to it is the Botanical Gardens. This is what the cemetery looks like at ground view. Probably looked very similar at the time because the older sections have been preserved. So this is probably exactly what it looked like when, you know, of course, is a fictional event, but had there been a funeral on this day, uh, that's probably what it would have looked like. The weather was uh, nice and this is an older section about that time frame so that's where they would have been. They uh, refer to O'Connell's Tower and this is it. Uh, O'Connell was a, a guy back in the 17th century that fought for the rights of Catholics in Ireland. Uh, being under the domination of the English and the Church of England, uh, uh, Catholics were uh, banned from many activities and this guy fought for Catholicism and uh, Catholic rights and they say that it, you know there's a line in Hades where he says, uh, they said, oh there's uh, O'Connell's uh, grave and he says, yeah, oh yes, but his heart's in Rome. This guy had his heart buried in Rome and his body is buried here at Glasnevin Cemetery. And, you know, Dignam's uh, funeral service would have been held in this chapel and then they would walk out past this and past Parnell's grave as well. And they'd be walking through an area like this and out to bury Patty Dignam. There's frequent references to Parnell. This guy, uh, Charles Stewart Parnell, was a uh, late 18th century, or I guess 19th century, I don't know how we say it, late 1800s. He uh, fought for Irish home rule. He was a member of the British uh, Parliament, and uh, he tried to persuade the British uh, government to allow Ireland to go to home rule. They've made a great deal of advancements in that direction. He's a great hero in Ireland, and he nearly achieved uh, home rule for Ireland. And then he was caught up in a scandal with a, a married woman, and that brought about his downfall in the strictly Catholic Ireland. So his career. He was a great hero to Ireland and his career totally crumbled to bits. He uh, was in shame. The church condemned him. People turned their back on him and he died at age 45 uh, just uh, trying to win re-election. He campaigned and campaigned and campaigned and it's, it's sort of like the American president who did the inaugural address in the rain and then died of pneumonia 30 days later. He uh, contracted pneumonia on his campaign. He gave this uh, big rally in the rain, and he was fighting to regain and reclaim his name, and he fell ill and died shortly after the election. And this is where Parnell is, is buried. Uh, just off to the left here is where O'Connell's grave is. So they walk past O'Connell, and then they go past Parnell, and they talk about 
Parnell. Parnell is frequently referenced in the book. And this is what Parnell's uh, grave looks like. It's just a big stone, and they mention that, that there's just a rock there. And then the guys say, well, he's not really buried there. He's, he's coming back. And then they say, oh, Parnell will never come back. And that's what his grave looks like. Then there are a couple of other references, and I came across this image when I was searching on the Google Earth, and I thought it was, they both kind of fit this uh, IHS. This is where Bloom is in the church, and it's on the back of the priest. That This is often used in Catholicism. It's from a Greek abbreviation of uh, Jesus uh, is what it means. It's, it's from the Greek, and it's an abbreviation of Jesus, and... Um, often people uh, think it means things. And uh, remember, Bloom says, what was this? I have suffered. That's what he thinks it is, but it's it's from the Greek. And then uh, I thought this statue was, uh, it just reminded me of that joke that the guy tells at the cemetery is, it doesn't look a thing like Mulcahy. I just thought it was kind of funny. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this video. Thought I'd add a little special effect to today's episode. We're on our way to Hades. This has been a very tough video for me to prepare for. This seemingly simple episode has so many moving parts and so much stuff going on. It's very difficult to condense it, pack it in. And Joyce is the master of packing. He probably would have been a Tetris expert. Remember that game? Well, let's go to Hades. Now that we've toured the cemetery, let's go to Hades. As always, we start with the parallel to the Odyssey. So let's start with that. All right, so in the, in the Odyssey... In the Hades episode, Odysseus performs a ritual to call up the dead. Now, what's happened is he has a crew member that has taken a fall. The guy crashes to the deck. He's up in the crow's nest. He crashes to the deck. He dies. And Odysseus performs this ritual to call up the dead. And the first guy to appear is this one that's um, the dead crew member. And he wants a, a proper burial. Uh, not a burial at sea, but he wants a proper burial in, in the ground. So Odysseus sets out to uh, venture into this land and, and see what he can do there. And it turns out it's Hades, and he meets his, his dead mother. He meets uh, the heroes of Greek mythology. Many of them w will be mentioned and he also runs into this guy, Ajax, who refuses to speak with him. He's angry about losing a contest some time ago uh, to Odysseus. You will see in Ulysses there is a parallel there with this guy, uh, Minton, at the end, who is uh, mad at Bloom, still carries a grudge with Bloom. They got in an argument over uh, bowling. Uh, many years ago, and that's probably an allusion to them being uh, competing suitors for Molly. Okay, so this guy remembers Molly. He's, he remembers the exact number of years that he last danced with Molly. Thanks fondly of her. And, um, and then he remembers getting in this argument with uh, Bloom over bowls, bowling. And uh, so that every uh, character in the Odyssey uh, can be referenced in Ulysses. And that people have written essays and, and, and entire books on this one episode and all the characters and how they parallel uh, in Ulysses and, uh, and the Odyssey. I'm not going to go through all that because there are dozens of them and it would take hours of, of lecture. But uh, suffice it to say that all the characters have some sort of meaning 
that tie back into the original Odyssey. Um, we have a character, uh, Tantalus, is tormented by hunger and thirst. Um, Odysseus also encounters Sisyphus, who is the guy that pushes the rock up the hill, and just as he gets there, the rock falls down, he has to start over and push it up again. See if you can find that character. Um, see if you can find the hunger and thirst uh, Tantalus, and see if you can find Sisyphus. Those are two pretty easy ones to find in this episode. So, enough about the Odyssey. Let's get on with Ulysses. So we've we've done a little tour of the cemetery. I wanted you to have that going in, and I think that's interesting stuff. I hope you enjoyed it. Now let's get on with the episode, okay? So we have the highlights of this episode. Now, I like to sort of recap to you what happens, because sometimes we get lost and we find ourselves saying, oh, how do we get here, or where are they now, or what's going on? So I'm going to just recap that, and then we're going to break it down into some digestible parts. So it starts with the boys, um, Simon, uh, Mr. Power, and, um, uh, oh gosh, okay, and Martin Cunningham, uh, getting into the carriage to go to the funeral uh, burial of their uh, friend, Patty Dignam. Now, I don't think Bloom is that close with Patty Dignam. He is in this circle of, of friends, but it's rather loose because Bloom is always the outsider. He's always the butt of jokes. He's not really uh, in the friendship clique. I doubt if it was his funeral, all these people would be going. But, um, you know, he's, he's ever the, the, the good pal, so Bloom is there. And so they, they hop in the carriage and they take the uh, ride to the cemetery, which is probably the first uh, little over half of the episode is about the carriage ride up. As they ride up to the cemetery, they pass these monuments. They make references to uh, the... Uh, the, the foundation where the um, Parnell uh, statue is going to be, and they, they make reference to the um, O'Connell uh, statue. and it, So this is sort of a, a tie-in to the uh, going past the heroes on their way to Hades. They also see a funeral of a child, uh, which reminds Bloom of Rudy, they pass Blazes Boylan, who tips his hat to all the people in Dublin. You'll see they're tipping their hat, which is custom in a uh, funeral procession as a show of respect. So you'll see, uh, when you see references of people nodding or tipping their hat, that's, that's because they're seeing a funeral procession uh, pass by, and that's custom. And when they pass Boylan, and we'll get into this a, a bit more in a bit, in, in a minute, hopefully in a minute, um, Bloom is not yet ready to face this guy. He's not ready to face his feelings about him. And they, they point him out, oh, there's Blazes Boylan. And the other guys in the carriage are happy. Oh, look, there he is. And he tips his hat. And Bloom looks down at his nails, and he thinks, oh, worst, worst man in Dublin. They pass this character, Reuben J. Now, Reuben J is of the... Uh, uh, tribe of Reuben. He is a Jewish guy, and um, that stirs up some emotion in these guys in the in the carriage. He he puts his hand out. They say he he's old and he's stooped and he puts out a curled hand, and as his salute, and um, Stephen did uh, Stephen uh, Simon curses him and. You know, maybe the devil break your back and that kind of nonsense. And the, they laugh and say, oh, we shouldn't be joking around. And 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 then the comment is made that, uh, well, we've all been there. And and then and then they say, well, not all. <laughs> 
Now, what what are they referring to? Are they they're all old, or they've all been stooped, or they've all been joked about? No, it's because he is Jewish. They've all been to him to borrow money. It's uh, the Jewish money lender theme is there, and so they've all had to go to this guy to borrow money. And you know, people generally resent creditors, and so they've all been there. And then they look at Bloom and say, "Well, nearly all," because Bloom, being also of the tribe of Reuben has not uh, borrowed money from him, uh, they assume. So uh, they also pass an old man uh, selling bootlaces. And he used to be a successful lawyer. And uh, Bloom thinks, yeah, why was he kicked off the doles? He's an old guy. They have a retirement program. Uh, sort of head of their time, and why why was he, you know, why doesn't he get his pension anymore? What's up with that? He used to be a successful lawyer, and now he's selling uh, bootlaces on the street. So what's, who is that character? Hint, hint. They're stopped momentarily by cattle being herded through the streets. So that you hear whoop, whoop, and yeah, and the guy's herding these cattle through the street and that stops traffic and then uh, Bloom they ask Bloom to look out the window you know what's going on and Bloom says oh it's a uh, cattle and then Bloom thinks oh yeah killing day and so we have this scene of everything about death they're on their way to the funeral we see the the uh, coffin of the child pass by and then we see these cattle going to slaughter and of course, the, the best ones all go to England. They get the juicy ones, Bloom thinks. And, uh, and he makes the, the expression that there's a lot of money in the dead meat trade, which is the funeral business, the funeral industry. It's, um, I mean, this gets darker and darker as they move toward the cemetery. As Odysseus crosses rivers and goes deeper toward the, the innermost hell, which is a, a theme commonly uh, used in in older writing. In um, the Divine Comedy, Dante also talks about crossing the river Styx into the various circles of hell. We, we seem to get this picture that it gets worse and worse as you move in. And they cross the rivers as they move toward the, the innermost circle of hell. Eventually they arrive at the cemetery and uh, I think one of the uh, funny parts of this episode is that, that Bloom jokes in his head that uh, the the dead guy beat him there. You know, they step out of the carriage and the, and the hearse is already there and the, you know, the, the, the dead guy is the first to arrive. Just it's kind of, I think, humorous in Joyce's way. They point out graves, as I mentioned in the little cemetery introduction. Uh, they uh, point out O'Connell, Parnell. Uh, Simon uh, points out where his wife, Stephen's mother, is, is buried, and he says he'll soon be there, and he <laughs> sort of does a tear, but I, I think there is a degree of sincerity, but probably just at the loss of who's going to take care of the kids more than a real grief. Uh, we find uh, Simon uh, later off drinking with the boys. Um, and then at the end, uh, Bloom points out that uh, one of the fellow's hats is, is crushed. The guy doesn't even acknowledge Bloom. Martin Cunningham says, oh, yeah, this is a little thing there, and he fixes it and puts it back on, and they move on. And the episode ends. So Bloom isn't even acknowledged for that. Now, as we noted in the previous video, Bloom has undergone this baptism. He went to the bath. He has the lemon soap. He still has it with him. And he's reminded of that when he sits in the carriage. He, he's uncomfortable and he remembers, I oh, yeah, the soap. He's sitting on the soap. So he is cognizant of both the bath and the soap. The, the, the bath was the baptism and the soap that did the cleansing. Uh, and I'm not going to go too metaphorical with that. You, you get the idea. But he 
is reminded of that. He's glad he took the bath. He remembers the bath. He thinks of the bath. He's, he's, he feels good because he's clean. He remembers the soap because he's sitting on it. So he's undergone this baptism, and in uh, much of uh, mythology, once the hero has had his his baptism, you know, he's stricken by lightning, or he has an epiphany, or you know, any breakthrough, the first challenge is to descend to hell. Even even the Bible talks about after the crucifixion, you know, Christ rose on the third day. Well, where was he the rest of the time? Well, he uh, descended to hell. You know, he had to go down to hell and and save anybody that could be saved and and experience that uh, for himself. We see Bloom now following his baptism. He must face the demons, death, and the hell that uh, is of his own making and and of this earth and our life. So. It's a form of tempering to harden the hero to go out and face the other evils. Now, you know, in the horror movies, there's a common theme about, you know, they say, well, don't think about your worst fear, you know, because then it'll happen. So if you're afraid of spiders, you think, oh, gosh, I'm afraid of spiders. And then all of a sudden, all these spiders appear. This is a bit what Joyce is evoking here. He throws these things out, of, out at us that evoke fear and and we see that Bloom is able to deal with it he's able to handle it he's able to face these demons as they come up and I'll give you some specifics about that shortly there are really two big demons in this episode that Bloom must deal with we must face what we fear and we must recognize hypocrisy for what it is. So facing your fears, of course, death being the big one, is is the first thing that Bloom will slay, and this is in preparation of the other parts of himself that he must deal with, but he must first deal with this death issue, because the death of Rudy, his father, these things hang on him. Stephen's uh, loss of his mother, they hang on him. Death is hanging on these characters. It's keeping them from being what they could be. So he must face the fear, and he must deal with death, and he must face the hypocrisy that's all around him. And Bloom has seen these things in the past. I've talked in the previous videos about that. Bloom sees this stuff, but he doesn't really deal with it. Now he's going to see hypocrisy and begin to point it out and be specific about it, and I'll give you some things to look for. Also in this episode, we see that the caretaker at the cemetery that has the keys in his back pocket and their cross, which is a symbol of independence and home rule, uh, will encounter that again in the next episode. This keys, and the keys have come up before in previous episodes, Always watch for references to keys. They always represent independence, home rule, free Ireland, free thinking, independence in all aspects. Now, when Bloom sees the keys this time at the cemetery, it reminds him, huh, yeah, I have to remember to get that ad because he's after an ad from a guy named Keys and the guy wants a picture of two keys crossed on his ad and seeing the keys reminds Bloom of that. So while these other characters are planning to go out and have a drink later and they're going through this again another one of these numbing Catholic rituals Bloom is thinking about the real world and getting back to work and so when they're gonna go off and get drunk he's gonna go back to work and we'll see that that's exactly what happens in the next episode. They, uh, they place an obituary for Patty Dignam and then they go off drinking, and they're all drunk by the end of the day, and Bloom is, goes to work, pretty much. We want to address the victories that Bloom has. What fears does Bloom face? What does he fight? What does he conquer? What does he defeat? Of course, death. 
we get death from the from the beginning of this episode when he gets in the carriage go back and read that description of bloom closing the door i mean he he, he doesn't just get in shut the door and grab the the uh, strap that keeps you from flopping around go back and read that description it's very evocative of the sealing of the coffin he pulls it tight and seals it up and latches it firm and uh, read that because it's kind of creepy we face the death of a child you know he sees the hearse with the with the small coffin on it and that reminds him of of Rudy and he begins to process this uh, Bloom is beginning to start to to process some of these terrible painful things and the death of his son is the big one that's caused the the rift part of the cause of the rift with his relationship with his wife and it's part of his general problematic psyche and he begins to deal with that he starts to process it and and death in in general bloom accepts the finality of death he doesn't need and this is one of his big victories i would say is that he doesn't need the the catholic comfort he doesn't need to be prayed over in latin he doesn't need the ceremony when he looks around the funeral he or the cemetery he he basically says when you're dead you're dead that's it i mean he faces that reality the others prefer the denial and the oblivion they they prefer to hide in in behind the church and in drink and decay now when they're in the carriage they notice that there are crumbs on the seat and that is decay that is the rot that is all around you in Dublin everything is in decay and is stagnant and rot bloom references the the gas works and the smell from the from the gas works and that um, they were fortunate that uh, Millie never had any serious illness and so many kids die from so many disease that there's just death in the air in Dublin and and that's the smell of the gas works reminds you of that there's a constant everywhere you look you see uh, there's hearses going by there's the smell of the gas works there's stagnation and death everywhere in this episode of course we have usurpation which is the ultimate form of death that death can uh, take you and when that happens that's the ultimate usurper we see the English as usurpers again because the cattle are going off to merry old England and they're just headed off in droves to slaughter. Now, I would encourage you to look up the Irish potato famine and do a little reading on that because the English have some roots in that potato famine. It, it wasn't just the crop failed and the, and the Irish starved. Uh, the English took the food supply and uh, you know, I, I'll probably get comments about that, but it's reality. Look up Irish history. So Bloom is referring to that, that the juiciest go to England. And um, so off, off they go to slaughter and off to feed uh, merry old England. Also, there is no dignity in death. And, and Bloom says, you know, he talks about you never know who will touch you and that they, they they cut off some nail and save a piece of hair and it's an unclean trade and then he's talks about the body decaying and leaking and they, they plug the orifices with wax to keep them from leaking and there's a reference to a funeral the week before where they were racing through the street up to the cemetery and the and the coffin flipped onto the road and the corpse fell out and that was a gruesome scene there's just no dignity and then he wonders would dignum bleed you know if he fell out you know and and bloom sort of represses this a little jokingly that he sits up and looks around and what's up you know what's happening and then he wonders if he'd bleed and it's, it's kind of a, a gruesome we see the the poverty failure 
stagnation everywhere. It's all forms of death all throughout Dublin. And these are all fears that the other characters sort of wallow in while Bloom begins to rise. Now, I said before that there's a lot of hypocrisy and paradox in this episode. First of all is the treatment of Bloom. I think it's very hypocritical and, and paradoxical because he is the friend, he's attending the funeral, but it starts right off the bat with the three guys get in and then come along Bloom. You know, it's the first thing they say to him, come along Bloom. They say, are we, they get in, are we all here? Come along Bloom. So he's, he's disrespected right from the beginning. It's, uh, it's poor treatment of Bloom right at the onset. Then they talk about what killed Patty Dignam. And uh, you say, well, heart. And Bloom thinks, heart? It wasn't heart. He died of drink. John Barleycorn is what killed him. He talks about the red nose. And he said, you know, he spent a lot of money painting that nose red. It wasn't heart failure. It was John Barleycorn. So we have that hypocrisy. We see the other funeral, the death of the child, and it's, oh, it's terrible. It's a, you know the worst, the worst there is, and yet there is no compassion for Bloom, who lost a child. They they must know it. The child was not stillborn. He died a few days after death. They had an actual funeral. He's buried probably in Glasnevin Cemetery. Uh, Bloom alludes to it when they're up there, that that's where Mama is next to Rudy. And, uh, you know, that's where he bought the plot. Now, he just points and says over there. So he may mean, you know, up at the other uh, cemetery, but likely no. And I think uh, no, because uh, I just think that what Joyce is trying to tell us is that Bloom is not caught up in the same kind of stuff that the other people are caught up in. He doesn't need to go visit graves. Dead is dead. That's just where they're buried. And there's compliance with social norm and that's why they're buried there. Uh, Bloom also mentions that uh, cremation, why not cremation? You know, it, it would save a lot of space. And then he says, you know, they do, oh, it's against the, the religion doesn't allow it. And yet during the time of the plague, they throw everybody in a hole, cover them with lye and let that lie just eat it up. So that's okay. But uh, cremation isn't. You know, and, and Bloom catches these hypocrisies. And then he says, you know, gosh, think of all these coffins, all this wood going to waste. Why can't they just make a nice, he says, a nice beer, and then you could put the body on it, do the ceremony, and then just open a trap, and they just slide down into a hole. And then he says, well, they, they, they probably resent the commonality of it. So uh, Bloom is constantly catching these sort of quirky, things, but he's not falling into the trap, which I just, uh, I love about the character. Now, when the, when they're stopped because of the cattle, Bloom says, why don't they just run a train? You know, they could run a train from the stockyard right down to the dock so they can move these cattle without stopping traffic. They could just run a train down. And you know, it's interesting that that's, you know, like setting up a conveyor belt of death, basically. And then in the in the next breath, he says, you know, as a matter of fact, we could do it uh, for people. We could run a, a tram right up to the cemetery. And, and then they make the crack about, oh, that'd be great, dining car and saloon. You know, that, uh, you know, they'd be partying all the way up to the cemetery and then they sort of well why not you know that the Irish have wakes anyway so why why not do that but there is a there is a hypocrisy and a paradox there to that too they pass Stephen and this is another one of the hypocrisies that it's pointed out that Stephen is there and and Simon the, the cleverly worded I go back and look at this too Simon crosses the carriage to look out the window to see Stephen, but he doesn't quite catch him. And then he asks if his his uh, fetus Arcades is with him, Mulligan. And uh, they say no, he was he's by himself. And and then he 
proceeds to uh, badmouth Mulligan that he's some terrible guy. And there's hypocrisy there in that Simon is not taking care of his own kids. He's not taking care of his son. He's not giving his son anything. And he's not feeding his own children. We find out later that the kids are in tatters and they barely have anything to eat. And Simon's out borrowing money. Rather than work, he's borrowing money so he can drink. And he borrows some money from power to go drinking. And he gives his daughter, who is starving, a couple of pennies and tells her to go buy a bun and go home. And he goes out drinking. So more hypocrisy. And Bloom sees it. And first he, he sort of says, oh, the guy's so full of himself and full of his son. And then he says, well, you know, I would be too. And then he thinks about Rudy some more. We see Boylan, as I mentioned earlier. They say, oh, look, Blaze is Boylan. And he's wearing a straw hat, which I think is... Uh, I think there's something there. Everybody else is wearing the the bowlers, the the traditional round hats, and and Boylan is in a straw straw hat as the straw man, and he tips his straw hat. I put some thought into that, and when they pass Boylan, uh, Bloom looks at his nails and thinks, you know, worst man in Dublin. Now that's in anger. Boylan is probably not the worst man in Dublin. I think there are worse. We're going to meet some of them. But um, Bloom is beginning to have some anger. Before he was kind of, you know, the cuckold. He was just the take it. You know, he's subservient to Molly. He's feeding her. He makes breakfast. He doesn't mention any of this stuff. He kind of lets it all go. Now he's got a little anger for Boylan. He's beginning to come around and find himself. And, you know, the, much of the blame belongs on himself as well, but he is also beginning to express some anger toward Boylan, which he hasn't before. He's had, he's had shame, embarrassment, he's avoided it, but now he's beginning to have some anger. Part of the hypocrisy in, in this is also that power is keeping a mistress. We get a reference to that, some barmaid somewhere that he's uh, taking care of. And then uh, Bloom says, must be, must be really hard on the wife, which I think he is relating to his own uh, position in that sort of relationship. But he's basically in a carriage with three hypocrites. They joke about suicide. They they tell the joke about Reuben Jay's kid tries to kill himself by uh, the the father realizes he's mixed up with this girl he doesn't want him to be involved with this girl so he's going to ship him off to the Isle of Man for a while until he gets over it and on the way to the boat the kid jumps over the wall into the river uh, Liffy and uh, he tries to kill himself and a, a boatman comes by gets the kid on a pole, fishes him up, and puts him up to the father. And they joke about that. Bloom starts to tell the joke, and they cut him off. And uh, so he tries to be one of the boys, and they won't let him, and they finish the story. And then uh, Simon says he's one in haypence too much. You know, he's, he's paid too much. He gave a silver florin, which is next to nothing. And uh, I think his uh, silver florin is like two shillings. So he gave him next to nothing for saving his kid. And, and Simon says, well, he still paid too much. And then they all get a good laugh and cover their face and say, oh, we should be serious. And then they go, well, Patty would never deny us a joke. Finest little man to ever wear a hat. You know, that kind of nonsense. But they joke about that suicide. But then, you know, they talk about the, the worst thing that could happen in a family is a suicide. And they go on and on about that, and cowardly. And, you know, um, Power knows about Bloom's father, and he, he looks at his watch and looks away. I've just made a decision. This video needs to be two parts. Because I'm going long, I'm already past 30 minutes. That's too much. It'll take me like 14 and a half years to upload this. So now go to part two of the Hades episode.
Irish. Red breast, 12 year. Ah, to Patty. <laughs>